Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Dream, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink podcast and Counterweight podcast with my co-host, David Bernstein. Today, we have Jonathan Church with us. Jonathan Church is an economist, a very prolific writer, and he just wrote the book, Reinventing Race. And you can find all this, and I'll put this in our show notes as well, on his website, jonathandavidchurch.com. So, Jonathan, before we get started today, what are you drinking for this conversation, if anything? Uh, Just a bottle of water. Um, there it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm a pretty sober, sober person overall. Uh, uh, by the way, I would just say, uh, not not that it's a big concern to me, but um, the, uh, the the title is Re- reinventing racism. racism. Um, uh, but uh, the only reason I mention that is because it's the ism that I um, sort of take issue with. But at any rate. Um, yeah, uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, yeah, just just water. Um, <laughs> when uh, when we were in the uh, office, uh, as you know, now it's um, uh, all telework, uh, which you know allows me to sign off and do this. But when I was um, in the office, I drink uh, two cups of green tea every day as well. So, but I, for some reason, I haven't continued that at home. Well, I um, actually am doing water too. I mean, it's a little more exciting. It's a, it's a watermelon sparkling water. But yeah, today is not a, a, a drinking day for me. <laughs> David, what about you? So I'm doing um, red wine once again. Oh, and nice. I poured it about 45 minutes ago because I had a Zoom before this. And I've been nursing it since then. So I'm not <laughs> sure I'm going to be at my best, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> so thank you, Jennifer. Well, um, you, Jonathan, I've got the first question for you, but I did want to say thank you for correcting. I'm sure we're going to get into it, why it's racism that's very important versus race. And, and so my apologies on on um, getting the title incorrect. But this is my question for you, and, it, and we can get into it. You're an economist. And I have to tell, and, and a prolific writer, but an economist, and, and I have to confess as someone who studied political science, international relations, and now I find myself very much in this uh, critical social justice landscape, I oftentimes wish I was a mathematician or a doctor, or I chose something that was just like, it was just the numbers, you know, because it's a, kind of dangerous in this world now. And so you, you're an economist. What got you interested in social justice, in reinventing racism in your new book that obviously is something that um, is very important to you. Oh, and by the way, I don't think you know this. I'm really excited to meet you because um, the first alternative supplemental guide I gave to the 21 day racial reading equity challenge, uh, which Counterweight published a while ago, uh, you one of your pieces was in that. So, and it was on, on white fragility. So how did you go from a, from being an economist to having this interest in critical social justice? Um, so I, I first just wanted to say real quick that it's not a real big deal about the, the title. Um, I mean, in some sense, I sometimes think that uh, I should have had a better title um, in terms of just making real white fragility more prominent as opposed to being in the subtitle. Because uh, it ultimately is a critique of uh, Robin D'Angelo's theory of white fragility, but um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not a promotional guy, so I actually was kind of aiming at a, a certain theme, which really is about reinventing racism. So it might not have the same kind of ring to it, but it, it re- actually is all about that. But you know, at the same time, as, as I guess maybe is ever evident here is it's maybe not as catchy. So you know, but uh, anyway, with that said. Um, I guess uh, you could say that, um, or I could say that I've had an interest in these types of issues for many years. Um, and I say that in the sense that back when I was in college, I, I kind of uh, went from a somewhat right-leaning, right-leaning high school student to a more left-leaning high college student. 
And one of the first things I wrote as a freshman in college was a op-ed for the paper about, um, you know, the underprivileged and so on, uh, which, by the way, these days, somewhat problematic, problematic to say underprivileged because supposedly you're normalizing privilege. You know, that's the whole reification fallacy or issue and whatever. But um, that, that kind of leads into subsequent discussions on this. But so that was one um, al op-ed I paper. Uh, op-ed I wrote, which actually you can find online now, but, um, and then I got into critical theory, uh, and more specifically the Frankfurt School, um, and that I kind of um, got interested in through philosophy. I ended up uh, just sort of by luck, I just took a, a, a course, um, I don't even quite know why I chose it, but I ended up taking a course with a professor who I really liked, and I ended up taking about five or six with him, and all about continental philosophy and all and all that stuff, uh, but particularly the Frankfurt School, and and I got on board with it. I, I actually really was a fan of it back then. Um, I think it's kind of you know it's gone in many di directions, uh, critical theory that is, um, uh, and I, I still have a certain soft spot for uh, you know the Adornos and the and the Horkheimers, and, and I can talk about that. But at any rate, you could say it's kind of rooted in there. Um, but at the same time, I was studying economics, and then I went out to the private sector. And for several years, I was kind of getting, I was getting doing economics. I got interested in foreign policy, the wake of the war, and everything. But um, I have a sibling who's very, very been very active in social justice stuff for many years, and so you know, some back and forth conversations over the years. But uh, I'd say sometime around, um, as everybody seems to recognize now, somewhere around maybe 2013, 14, 15, or so. Uh, this stuff really started to ramp up and take on uh, um, uh, resonance with a lot of people. Um, and uh, some, somewhere around 2016, early 2016, I started writing a weekly column for the Good Men Project, <clears throat> which is a very progressive outlet, and they're very interested in social justice issues. So I, I was writing about those and, and other stuff, personal as you would say, is and everything and stuff like that. But um, there was one article I wrote. Uh, it was about whether social justice activism is susceptible to confirmation bias. Um, so one of the central problems I have with, uh, or issues or concerns that I have with um, a lot of this is the extent to which you have a worldview or a framework um, which is rigidly applied to various phenomena that we observe uh, in society, in the world, and so on. Um, and so it's less of a flexible conceptual framework that we can sort of adjust according to the circumstances and more of a rigid, rigid framework where we take anything we see and sort of shoehorn it through this framework. And so um, I think in this particular case, it had to do with uh, uh, an article by um, somebody in the Federalist about uh, difference between sexual harassment and sexual tension or, or anyway it's been a while I should actually remember what I wrote but I can't say I do right now because the, the overall point is just applies to everything about what way you have and so anyway I sent this article to my sibling who said um, you know why do you always get so defensive about you know white privilege and social justice and so on um, I didn't realize that I had been, but I don't think, in fact, I don't really think I was because at the same time I was writing articles and I have many articles that I've written actually uh, supporting various social justice I initiatives, um, uh, which then essentially sheds light uh, on what, you know, what we're dealing with here, which is that any sort of skepticism or questioning or any sort of uh, pushback or I don't know, it's just uh, doubts uh, is just seems to be unacceptable. Uh, and that um, when I really only raise the question about whether conf confirmation bias is a problem, immediately um, the question is, uh, you know, you're fragile. And I think I wrote this in mid-2018. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So that must be why fragility came up because D'Angelo's, book had been released that summer so obviously she my sibling would have been aware of that and so that came up you know why so fragile why so fragile and uh i guess i'll finish up by saying i was right right driving back from myrtle beach i think for family thing and 
I stopped in a rest stop because I was thinking about this and started te texting up a whole bunch of thoughts to myself, which en ended up turning into an article for Colette uh, later that month. And then it just sort of took on a life of its own and wrote, you know, over a dozen essays and a book about it because white fragility seemed to encapsulate uh, so much of the, um, I mean, I say this hesitatingly because I, I, I don't necessarily think that it's all bad, but city, so, sort of growing intolerance that you observe within the so-called critical social justice activist movement. So you, you talked about how there was this sort of perceptible ideological shift that you said 2013, 2014. It's interesting. I was the head of a nonprofit organization that dealt with college students at that time. And prior to 2014, um, I noticed that a lot of the students embraced what, what I would have called a soft form of postmodernism. All narratives are equal. Everybody has a story. Everybody's story is equal. No, no one organization or people has a better claim than any other. It was sort of this, um, this narrative framework that they brought to their student activism and the like. And around 2014, I noticed a huge shift. Um, and I'm trying to understand what happened around then that would have, uh, would have affected, is it just a new generation? Did we go from millennials to Gen Z or was there something perhaps Black Lives Matter that came onto the scene that shifted the ideological parameters? What, what's your theory of that? I don't have anything definitive to say about that, but um... If I were to offer a hypothesis, which you know would have to be investigated and tested and thought about and criticized and all that, um, is that it was a latent uh, tendency that had sort of been growing. Um, so I think that what uh, that when was uh, when did Trayvon Martin? When did that happen? I, I think that, that was around two thousand. 13, 2014, and right, then when Fer the trial Fer was Ferguson yeah. was 2016, I think. 2015, okay. 2016. Well, at any rate, you had some very, you know, legitimate protest movements that arose at the time, um, and I think Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. arose at that. But but anyway, I mentioned those because those became very, you know, obviously made, became headline events that um, everybody was concerned about, um, and they ended up, they, I, I would say that that sort of perhaps, and again, I say this only contingently, but perhaps gave uh, a um, impetus to latent tendencies within more long-term activist scholarly circles, which in my view had been sort of building for many years. In fact, back when I was uh, in college with, um, study of critical theory and uh and you know so two things um i guess the easier one to start with is that when i was in college there was concern back then about uh left-wing politics among professors in academia yeah. uh i had joined uh a uh, student-run magazine for a little while which was a little bit more of a conservative and they had had a whole history uh uh uh, of defending sort of the sort of uh, free speech type stuff that particularly was relevant at Penn, which is where I was in light of the so old uh, water buffalo affair in the eight, early 90s. Mm, yes. Um, so they were really against campus speech codes and, and, and other stuff. But, you know, it was the 90s and, you know, um, it was all about Wall Street and, and growth and, you know, the victory of liberalism and capitalism after the fall yeah. of communism, whatever. So, um, while uh, this uh, sort of left wing sort of presence on the university it was there already, um, but it, it didn't yet have the national voice, perhaps, that it has now, at least uh, in terms of what we're talking about in critical theory, social justice, um, because, you know, it was the golden 90s, whatever, and we were just kind of coming out of the uh, Cold War which at the 
you know, for the 70s and 80s, at least, had sort of provided a unifying force, you know, being against communism and so on. And, you know, we had the 60s and 70s, but then it kind of petered out over time, particularly with some of the more, you know, um, violent forms of activism in the 70s. Um, but it really, I would say, you know, you can trace it intellectually back to like, you know, Hegel, Kant, whatever. But uh, I would say the 60s were key. Um, and a lot of the activists of the 60s seem to, you know, sort of gravitated towards academia over the long term as sort of this, what you might call Gramscian, Gramscian, Gramscian Antonio Gramsci product project of sort of war position taking over the institutions and so on. I mean, that's my theory. I mean, you'd have to make out, make that case, but I'd say uh, a good part of this is just 60s activists gravitating to the university and then over the course of decades, you know, developing the theories that ultimately became um, critical social justice. You have postmodernism, you have critical theory, you have a lot of different strains. And I don't want to take away from their concerns about, uh, you know, justice issues, um, but they were certainly developing a certain kind of theory, uh, critical justice and or critical theory and postmodern or whatever. Um, which I would say gained, I don't know if I want to say majority status, but by the 90s, it was there. And mm. then for a little while in the 2000s with Bush and the Iraq war, it kind of all those sort of left wing energies were channeled through that, I'd say. Um, but then that kind of petered out and you had the election of Barack Obama and Barack Obama was was uh, seemingly the post-racial president, but not, but, but that was, never you know for a little while that it was that whole you know hope and change stuff but you know he never challenged the establishment in the way that real uh uh what do i want to say um you know the real committed activists always wanted to do and so there was a sort of disappointment perhaps uh and meanwhile this undercurrent this intellectual undercurrent is continuing to establish itself in the university and then you know Eventually, you have these just social movements that arose, um, and it kind of all melded together. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of just uh, meandering, I guess, at this point. But, um, and, but I, 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 it's, it's an historical account that I've wanted to work out for myself for some time, but haven't fully done so. But I, I guess to sum up, I would say it's always been latent, and it just sort of, uh, it, it rose to a new level i guess once some you know some very visible acts of injustice had occurred that were then sort of shoehorned through this critical social justice uh uh framework um right and it and it got became so uh manifest that it actually left the university it left activist circles yeah. and it ended up in cor corporate america and that's so that's right. what i wanted to ask you about so you you written extensively about Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility. And uh, how do you characterize Robin D'Angelo's ideas about diversity in the workplace? So diversity in the workplace in particular. Or about race, racism in the workplace, however you choose to answer it. What's her core philosophy belief system about race and how it should play out and how it should be different in the workplace? Well, um, there is a, I just had, um, so I, I saw this podcast interview with Neil Shenby and I, I mentioned that because I want to credit him. He um, summarized the four core tenets as he sees it of critical race theory, which I think is fairly accurate. accurate. One is that racism is permanent and pervasive, it's everywhere. Uh, two, that it's hidden uh, ideologically, discursively. Uh, so you have things like colorblindness, universalism, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and in particular, whiteness. Uh, and that we can talk about this, learn about it, investigate it by talking about so-called lived experience. And then there's the fourth idea of intersectionality, which is basically that it's all inter interconnected, classism, like racism, sexism, and so on. So, you know, with that, that's the framework that she's operating from, from the literature and so on. Um, I would say that her more narrow focus is on so-called whiteness. 
and white fragility is what she calls one aspect of whiteness. Um, but because it comes from her leading, reading of the liter whiteness studies uh, literature and critical race theory or whatever, um, it's really ultimately a theory about what racism is and what how white people um, uh, advance or support or reinforce racism. And so I guess in her view is essentially that uh, that of the critical whiteness studies field um, and that uh, racism is a system and that it stands on a scaffold of ideologies and discourses, which um, she describes as the ideological ideologies and discourses of whiteness. Um, and I, mean, I can look it up real quickly to quote her, uh, but um, so what I've been trying to do right now is, is resist saying basically that all white people are racist. Um, I mean, <laughs> that is what her view is, but it, um, I mean, I guess that's your answer. But the reason I've been hesitating to say that is because it requires, you know, some working out of what she means by that. Um, so the first thing I suppose to say is that she wants to get away from what you might call an old school view of racism, which is that it's about good, not good and bad, or good and bad about race, prejudice, and whatever. But it's more about sort of prejudice plus plow, plus power, and it's about the system within which that prejudice might manifest. So that if you're a member of a dominant group, you can't really be racist because you're part of the dominant group, you know. And if you you're just you can exhibit prejudice, but not not racism. I mean, I take issue with that, but. Um, the way it operates for her is just by the way we talk and um, the ways in which we uh, not only talk, but act, the ha habits, social customs, the movies that we see, the music that we listen to, the posters that we put on our walls, uh, the artwork that we're attracted to. I mean, just about everything. I mean, uh, but it sounds like a dominant, what, you're, what she's talking about is a dominant culture. And in every society on earth, every organization has a dominant culture. Yeah, that what is one. Is, so, yeah. yeah. So why is it supremacist or systemically racist to have a dominant culture? Is that what she's essentially arguing here? Well, she's saying that there's a connection between the, the fact that there's a dominant culture and that there are persistent ongoing disparities and inequalities. Um, so. I mean, for instance, uh, um, I think uh, Orlando Patterson wrote in the early 90s in the uh, wake of the uh, Clarence Thomas uh, trial that, you know, it really was kind of indisputable that among all the um, developed, or uh, uh, I forget how he, he words it, but um, that America was the least racist uh, white majority society um in the world and you know he essentially made his case for that in a um new york times editorial you know based on laws that had been developed a decline of explicit discrimination whatever and um you know she would take issue with saying that hey you know we've got clarence thomas and third third grid marshall and and other people uh and i'm just bringing in examples from her book um Colin Powell, Marco Rubio, other people who are in positions of power, but they and Barack Obama, but they don't actually challenge the system uh, itself. So her view is that um, the system itself is racist, and that yeah, I mean it op uh, it both it ultimately operates culturally. I mean, there's cultural racism, which she doesn't really define very well in her books. Um, there's a rever aversive racism. Uh, there's colorblind racism, but yeah, I mean, essentially, um, one criticism is basically uh, you can make, which to me is perfectly valid and legitimate and goes without saying to me, is that, you know, ultimately all we're talking about is a dominant culture. It's just all we're talking about. Right. Right. Um, but her view is that that dominant culture does, in fact, uh, perpetuate inequalities. How did all this find its way into the corporate world where you have major companies and hedge funds and investment banks buying into this and, and holding trainings with Robin D'Angelo. How did that, how did that happen? Um, White Fragility says that, 
or theory says that um, in accordance with whiteness studies that, and, you know, people like James Baldwin and, um, and then, you know, subsequent people like uh, Barbara Alt Applebaum and France, mm -hmm. but, but basically that the problem of racism lies with white people. It, it's not, it should not be the burden of people, uh, of marginalized people of color and so on. Now, um, I mean, I agree with that too, in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, we all have to sort of work together to figure out how to um, erase these sort of systematic disparities um, and that we need to come up with policies that, you know, create equal opportunity and dignity and respect and, and, and all that for, for everybody. But <clears throat> white fragility is the idea that um, it's implicit bias, unconscious, it's rigid, you know, and that if you don't really get on board with changing the way that you think and talk and act and so on, and all these sort of various idiosyncratic um, uh, ways, that you're not helping, you know, you're, that you're complicit. You're basically fragile and you're, 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 if you express, so what I'm getting at to answer your question is that it's an easy, it's kind of white fragility is a catchy phrase that seems to offer a way forward. Um, Cause you know, so one of the, back last summer, somebody uh, called me uh, Rama Manuel's brother, actually, Ari Elman. Uh, after an art article, the, the wrote, movie guy, the Hollywood guy, sorry, I believe so. But anyway, he had all his employees reading White Fragility, and um, I had just written a, an article, Art Digital, which is, you know got like hundred thousand and whatever, so it kind of came to his attention. His view was that what he saw in it was framing, the idea of framing. So you see this idea of the white racial frame in Joe Fegan's work and so on, but basically the Racism is all about the fact that white people generally think in certain ways that are alike. There's a sort of collective unconscious. And so you want to bring in, uh, it's, it just seems to offer an easy answer. It's like implicit bias training or uh, reading white fragility, or it's, to, it's, it's just something that's out there, which the Illuminati believe is effective. And because there's so much concern now about you know, a lot of legitimate concerns about justice and so on. Um, you know, somebody in some corporation does a little research and says, hey, people are reading and talking about what Robin DiAngelo or Yvonne Candy or whatever. And so, you know, they're the recognized experts. So let's bring them in and help. You know, I mean, that's the only really, that's all I can think. I mean, I don't know. Um, I There's so much that you can think and see in history that, you know, just passing fads that ultimately faded out. You know, I mean, I remember when I was in elementary school, you had DARE, you know, D-A-R, I uh, forget what it even stands for, but it was about drug, um, resisting drugs or whatever. And then it just kind of petered out. And I mean, I don't know, maybe it's similar here, but uh, it just seems like a, a catchy way that, uh, or it just seems like this is what the Illuminati Illuminati say we should do, so let's do it. It's the best I can say, Ray, about that. You know, I'm going to go uh, out of the workplace for a second because you said something earlier that concerns me. I was having a conversation with my friend, the CEO of the China Bush Foundation, David Firestein, and we were talking, you know, China's our, both of our specialty. And you had mentioned how um, things, when, you know, when we had the Iraq war, things kind of calmed down because it was something that took our ideas off of, you know, our own internal um, angst or whatever in the United States. And one of the things that I was talking about with him and that was really concerning was things have reached such a crescendo right now in the United States. Are we going to find another enemy? I mean, is that the only way? that we might be able to pull back from that brink. And and David and I were talking, you know, just because you know, China is China and obviously um, it makes a good, it makes a good bad guy, right? Do you, I mean, is there a way that we can pull back from that brink without finding a, a common enemy outside of the United States? 
not not that this is intended as a segue of any sort, but um, that is actually one of the main um, goals, uh, purposes, uh, I don't know, of this new book that I'm working on, um, which is attempting to uh, divert the, uh, not divert, but change the conversation maybe, I mean, I'm just one good guy, so you know I don't have 30 years of uh, whole field behind me, but um, you know I can do what I can do. But basically, just uh, get away from talking about identity politics and talk about personal virtue, which is sort of a Stoic view, or and and also Spinoza, which uh, there's a lot of overlap there. So I'm going to talk about him too. Um, <clears throat> but the idea there is that there's this there's this theme of cosmopolitanism cosmopolitanism that uh, um, not that I have to go into all the you know the Stoics and Logos and Spinoza and God and nature and all that but the idea that there's a sort of um, total reality that we're all part of and that we all sort of manifest this uh, universe and substance and Logos and whatever but um, one of the things the chief concerns of Stoicism is the cultivation of virtue and there's four of them it's uh, wisdom moderation, courage, and justice. Justice is one of the four. And so Stoicism is very much about sto uh, justice. Um, and it's also very much about wisdom. And so, you know, you have to be able to, uh, you know, you, the exercise of reason is big as well. And the exercise of reason to sort of cultivate wisdom, to sort of understand what we should be pursuing in terms of justice. And what is justice? Well, you know, you have to sort of analyze that issue by issue. But one of the central very elementary ideas for me is just the idea that uh, we would treat people with dignity and respect regardless of, you know, whatever social identity group they're a part of. And that is ultimately the type of thing that I'm sort of interested in cultivating. And that while ideas like intellect intersectionality are not sort of without merit, I don't think that they merit being the central central area of focus. Um, and I think they can be very divisive. I was just reading a recently a passage from Epictetus, who's a Stoic philosopher, about, um, you know, why would you say I'm an Athenian? Why would you say I'm from Corinth? Why wouldn't you say I'm a citizen of the world? So that's the sort of idea that I'm getting at. Um, so that, that that's, I guess that's my sort of alternative way of thinking about it, um, is more of an individualist, but cosmopolitan, cosmo, cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism, and ethical foundation as opposed to this identity politics collectivist type of ethical, ethical foundation. Anyway, that's how I think about it. Well, and I love that you're bringing stoicism into, I, I just recently got into stoicism a little bit myself. And so I'd love to hear more about your thoughts, but that that might be the answer. And I do see more discussion about stoicism uh, in the you know public sphere. So hopefully that does provide an alternative to, let's say, going to war with China. Um, but for me, tell me, I want to hear more about, let me tell you what stoicism means to me and then and, and then correct me or, or add to it. But for me, it really is one of those things where it's just like looking at the world, um, good, bad, whatever. And, and I hesitate because I don't know much about to say neutral, but it's, it's um, you know, just kind of accepting things as they are. Uh, and, and my one problem with stoicism is it works really well for me when things are going bad, right? This is life, you know, forge ahead, you know, don't overthink, you know, think it, uh, control what you can control. But I really love to get excited about awesome opportunities, even though, <laughs> you know, they might fall through. Um, I, I'm, I'm an easily excitable person. So I don't really fall on the stoic side when it comes to, uh, ha happy things, if you will. But I love the idea of stoicism. And I think that you really hit, hit something unique as a way to use it as something that could actually heal our divide. Yeah, I would say, though, that uh, the stoics, I guess, you know, um, I guess I would distinguish between lowercase stoicism and uppercase stoicism, where the latter is referring to the philosophy and the philosophy um, is about sort of serenity and all that, but uh, but they also have something called I don't know if they say it or whether it's Massimo Massimo Pigliucci, Pigliucci uh, 
Well, actually, they, they actually might say it. But anyway, they have this notion of um, preferred indifference. Indifference. Uh, in other words, um, yeah, I mean, it's not like you should live your life around the idea of pursuing wealth um, as opposed to pursuing virtue. But if you can have wealth, it's a good thing, you know, and there's no, no nothing wrong with uh, being happy about it. Just as the same with um, good health and, and, and anything else, um, whether you're good at sports or winning a competition or whatever. So it's something to be preferred. It's just not something that should, uh, cons that should overwhelm you or consume you in a way that, or at the expense of um, your sort of you know, virtue, serenity, what, what have you. Um, but at any rate, yes, uh, I um, don't know how successful it would be, uh, but um, that is sort of the uh, idea that I've been sort of really trying to work out um, is uh, mm -hmm. stoicism as an alternative way to think about issues of justice. W won't, won't the critical social justice crowd just say that's just a form of privilege because it's meant to maintain the current system that is uh, that is favorable toward whites and white adjacent folks. Won't they just say you're just trying to get people to re be resigned to the world as it is rather than trying to solve the inequities? Um, they can say that. I would just argue that they're wrong. Um, now, there is a certain sense in which uh, Stoicism or Spinoza in particular, and perhaps more so for Spinoza, but he really just sort of more systematically works out the, the notion of a um, sort of pantheistic universe. But um, uh, there is a sense of like, um, you know, acceptance. So, for instance, um, one of the ways this work plays out is with microaggressions. And uh, I have a really big problem with the notion of microaggressions. But. One thing that is stoic, and I think it's Bill Irvine who actually writes about this, but the idea, but it's part of cognitive behavioral therapy as well, but the idea of developing sort of quote unquote insult pacifism, which is the idea that you don't just get worked up by every little sort of slight that you come across. Mm. Um, and that, uh, you know, we'll work this out, but I don't want to go on a tangent or anything. Um, uh, and so, you know, you, you might get the response, particularly uh, the Response uh, that I've been reading about white wing progressions, Monica Williams, or whatever. The idea is that these things are these slights and, and insults or whatever, the subtle slights, are part of a larger system and that they're everywhere. And if you don't fight them, if you don't point them out, the system just you know persists. Now, I have a lot of problems with that just because uh, I'm not a big fan of systems and whatever. I don't think what a, everything comes down to, because I mean, you know, one of the major, major problems is the idea that this thing is just never ending. I mean, D'Angelo will say that anti-racism is his lifelong work. It's never going to, you know, it just never ends and so on. And that uh, what you have is it's just, it's, it's like in the very DNA of society. And it's kind of, kind of and it's similar with like microaggressions is that um, you just got to constantly be looking for microaggression, again, confirmation bias. Um, and uh, what that does, it develops this hypersensitivity, which is what you see in this generation Z, right? Um, safetyism and, and all that. It's just a, it's just not cultivating resilience. It's undermining CBT and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're going to say you're not fighting the system and you're not changing the system. But I think that's a misreading of stoicism in the sense that, again, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, it's about um, what you can control versus what you can't control. And so it's, uh, stoicism is, is the exercise of reason, to cultivate your wisdom to be able to recognize what's in your control, what's not, what's not in your control. And working out what it means to be in control and not in control is another aspect of cultivating your wisdom. But the issue is it's a, it's, it is a philosophy of agency in the sense that you are directing your attention to the things that you can change for the bit. It is an interest in the interest of justice, but the impetus is from the individual and developing a sense of cosmopolitanism as the individual himself develops it. Um, so it's not a philosophy of passivity. Uh, it's not a, uh, a, a philosophy of simply standing in the rain for the sake of standing in the rain um, and doing nothing about it. Um, but it is about sort of under, you know, being ready to endure rain if you happen to get stuck in a rainstorm by accident. Um, 
So, yeah, uh, I, I think that that is something that you probably would hear, but I, I would dispute it in the way that I was disputing it. Is your book uh, that you're working on, on Stoicism, is it like we've been talking directly to kind of address where, where we are in society today and, and as a resolution to, to our con- current division and intention? Yeah, I mean, the idea is really, it really ultimately is about trying to reconcile. So um, I don't, for instance, support the banning of critical race theory. Um, first of all, I think that there's, uh, there is merit to some of the, uh, the more scholarly, you know, Charles Mills, for instance, is somebody I respect. I, I don't, I, I wish he would, I mean, I, you know, his book on the social contract, racial contract, I mean, the, the thing that you can see in Mills is he has a deep understanding of Western philosophy and then kind of runs with that in terms of white in, big ignorance and social epistemology or whatever. I have issues with that. Um, then, you know, intersectionality has some sort of common sense, you know, you know, you know, the idea that you can look at people as parts of, you know, you know race or class or sex or whatever. Um, and... I mean, I'm not going to deny that there's insight to be gleaned to that. And right. My view is that uh, it, it, there's also, and particularly for me, at least in, in the whiteness literature, there's a lot of flawed thinking as well, and that we should be ap- open to being able to critique it. And so CRT should be uh, one of many different ways we can think about. It. So um, we should be able to critique it. Uh, but what you we, we just wrote an essay on this, Jonathan. Okay. Uh, Jennifer and I, and I'm not lead from Carleton College, just wrote an essay saying that we shouldn't ban CRT. We should teach it critically, as we yeah. would other theoretical lenses. But so unfortunately, we're on the same page. Yeah, one, unfortunately, what you kind of, I mean, this is sort of impressionistic in the in a sense. I mean, I haven't done the rigorous study, but what you see is essentially an us versus them type of thing. Now, um, in the, so you have that chart that was controversial last study last not summer um, in the Smith, Smith, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian chart. Yes, no, yeah, the, the whiteness uh, traits. Yeah, like yeah. you know, objectivity and and um, uh, you know, time sensitivity. Yeah, stuff like that. Now, um, in the end, I mean, it was. It was somewhat problematic to say that I think it was if you really work hard or something, you can be successful. It, it's obviously very problematic to say that that's something that's white as opposed, you know, because it's it's actually kind of racist in a sense. I mean, at least people would say. Um, and so I think that the, the museum was correct to take down that chart. But at the same time, if you read the, uh, the website, you know, there is something to be said to talk to 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 talk about, you know, examining the ways in which uh, uh, white uh, supremacy in some way will manifest. I mean, there is room for introspection and, and self-critique as to how white people might um, uh, not be entirely helpful to the movement to undo inequalities and racial disparities and so on. The, the, the issue is to... Um, is for people who are critical of race, race, critical race theory, not to then become very smug in congratulating themselves for having convinced the Smithsonian to take down the chart, but rather be grateful that they did and then maybe be able to reciprocate by sort of acknowledging that um, it's helpful to talk about some of the more positive uh, aspects of what whiteness studies is trying to achieve. So basically trying to achieve that kind of reconciliation. Now, for me, the ideal leader, leader, stoic leader, if you will, is Abraham Lincoln, who obviously was navigating an even more polarized society at the time. And so he had to make a lot of compromises that are not uh, something that the more sort of doctrinaire social justice activists today are happy with. Um, This sort of became an issue at University of Wisconsin Madison, um, right. uh, and you know, for instance, they invoke a quote from the from the Douglas debate, uh, in which he clearly says, "You know, I'm in favor of the you know separation of races, white on top, or whatever." 
but to basically conclude that he's not pro-black on the basis of this this passage is very naive because um, it really divorces it from the fact that he had been accused of advocating for racial equality all along. I mean, it was it was only in response to Stephen Doug Douglas's constant race baiting throughout. And you're talking about 1858. Um, like he started off, you know, two sentences before that passage saying, I was in a hotel and an elderly gentleman comes up to me and says, you know, are you really in favor of racial equality? And right there, the audience breaks out in laughter as if that was, it was like a sort of absurdity. So, I mean, it gives you a sense of what you're dealing with. Like, uh, and so there's just, it's just, I mean, Doris Corden's Goodwin says, you know, armies of scholars have looked through this and tried to find instances of Lincoln engaging in racial bigness and they haven't found any. Fred, Fred, Frederick Douglass talked about, he was the only great man he had encountered in his life who did not look at me as, um, and remind me of the difference between us, of the difference of, I mean, mm -hmm. this is somebody in my view who was a quintessential anti-racist in terms of treating people with dignity and respect regardless of color. But then you have this passage, which, you know, in the context of the politics of the time is then taken uh, from our perspective of the 20th century. And, and it's just a very naive reading. And it's, um, it, it divorces it not only from the context, but prevents us from appreciating the extent to which in the long term, Lincoln advanced the cause of racial equality by just orders of magnitude, um, because he understood the art of the positive, but the pos possible, and made the possible the actual in the long run. And so, you know, just those are the types of things that I'm trying to argue. Um, mm. Is I'm, I'm, to sum up, I'm running away from purity, purity tests. Mm. Uh, if I might say, you cut quite the stoic figure yourself, Jonathan. I think. Uh, you're going to do a great job living up to the uh, ideal that you write about. It's, uh, do I look like a stoic or do I You talk do. You, 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 you look and talk like a stoic. Am I wrong, Jennifer? No, I'd agree. I'm looking forward to the book. Is it my haircut? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's just, a, it's, it's, just, it's just a piece about you. I, I don't know. For me, that, that's what stoicism is, too. Because, again, it's, it's not really getting yourself worked up about what you can't control. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I guess I was a bit animated in my um, defense of Lincoln. Uh, but, <laughs> I like okay. hearing it. Yeah. But then again, that's also, you know, recognizing the causal necessity of my animation. This is getting into Spinoza, but Recky, it's, <laughs> it's an active emotion as opposed to a passive movement emotion because it, it comes from uh, an adequate understanding of the... Uh, the, the causal force of my animation and so on. But anyway, that's Spinoza. <laughs> well, with that, I'm almost done with my drink. David, any final questions from you? No, I appreciate the time. And it's great to pick your brain because you, you can really help us with the theoretical underpinnings of the work that we do and the conversations we're having. So thanks so much for that. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. Like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week. Different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say Hold My Drink and the conversation gets real.